In this video, I'll be talking about how to perform a pediatric spine ultrasound. Understanding normal anatomical appearances is a prerequisite for the interpretation of various pathologies of the spinal canal and its contents. In newborns and infants, the spinal arches are predominantly cartilaginous which provides an excellent acoustic window for the ultrasound beam. Spinal dysrophism or spina bifida is a congenital anomaly resulting in a defective closure of the neural arch, it is classified into open and closed dysrophism depending on whether there is a skin defect overlying the abnormality. In open spinal dysrophism, there is direct exposure of the neural tissue and meninges to the external environment. In closed spinal dysrophism, the neural and meningeal tissues are covered by skin or subcutaneous tissue. Ultrasound is the preferred modality in neonates with suspected occult spinal dysrophism. Ultrasound should not be used to image open spinal dysrophism because of risk of infection. These are the common indications for neonatal spine ultrasound, midline cutaneous malformations of the back, for examples, hairy patches, skin tags, hemangiomas, pigmented spots, sacral dimples. High-risk lesions include atypical dimples greater than 5 mm in diameter, a location greater than 2.5 cm above the anus, congenital anomaly that is associated with occult spinal dysrophism like anal atresia, detection of sequelae of injury, for example hematoma after spinal tap or birth injury, postoperative assessment for cord retethering. The ideal scanning position is with the infant prone and slightly elevated to distend the fecal sac. You can place a roll towel under the baby's abdomen to slightly widen the posterior interspinal spaces. Spinal ultrasound is performed in both the longitudinal and transverse planes using a linear 5 to 12 MHz transducer scanning protocol. Scan over the region of interest carefully whether a sacral dimple, sacral creases, or hair tuft. Examine it with a high-frequency probe to look for any potential skin to fecal sac fistula. Make sure to use minimal pressure and lots of gel, avoid compressing any small fistula tract. Pseudosanus tract refers to a residual cord such as echogenic fibrous structure extending from the coccyx to an overlying sacral dimple. These tracts, unlike true dermal sinus tracts, do not contain any fluid or reveal any associated mass, moving down from the region of interest, examine the coccyx. The coccyx is unossified and appears to be hypoechoic. This should be assessed for any tracks to the surface. Then move superiorly to examine and image the sacrum. You should be able to see the end of the fecal sac in midline, and the tip of the sac lies around the body of S2. Next we need to determine the level of the conus. There are two primary methods to determine the level of conus. First method is to identify the lumbosacral junction and count up from L5. Second method is to identify the twelfth rib, and count down, a potential pitfall with this method is that some people have 11 or 13 pairs of ribs. Both methods should be used to improve the accuracy to determine the level of conus. Begin counting the sacral vertebral bodies from S5 to the level of S1. The L5-S1 junction is identified at the inflection point between the obliquely oriented sacral vertebrae and the more horizontal lumbar vertebrae. If the level is indeterminate, Mark the level of the conus with a small radiopaque marker and perform an X-ray of the lumbar spine. This should only be performed if there is sufficient clinical concern. Moving down from the conus, the cauda equina is visualized as a horse tail appearance. The normal spinal cord and cauda equina demonstrate pulsatile movements, which may be assessed with M-mode study. The phylum terminale is an echogenic band and should be less than 2 mm it should appear as thin closely related parallel lines extending from conus to the lowest reaches of the fecal space, next on transverse plane, sweep from the mid-thoracic region to the sacrococcygeal region. Take sequential transverse images of thoracolumbar spine. This is a transverse image of, of the spinal cord at thoracic spine level, the spinal cord appears hypoechoic, covered by an echogenic pile lining, and surrounded by anechoic cerebrospinal fluid spaces. The ventral and dorsal CSF spaces are nearly equal in dimension. The nerve roots appear echogenic. This is transverse spinal cord image at conus medullaris level. There is normal enlargement of cord at conus medullaris, which tapers distally. 
transverse spinal cord image at cauda equina level. Let's look at some of the common normal variants. It's important to recognize these normal variants to avoid misinterpretation as pathologic findings. Transient dilation of the central canal, the spinal cord may present a slight dilation of the central canal during the first weeks of life after birth in many healthy newborns which disappears later on. It should be differentiated from syringomyelia, which persists on follow-up imaging, ventriculus terminalis, Ventriculus terminalis corresponds to a small distension of the distal lumbar central canal of the spinal cord, above the tip of the conus medullaris, to be considered a simple variant, it should be smaller than 5 mm and stable over time. It results from an incomplete fetal regression of the embryonic terminal ventricle in the conus medullaris. Filler cyst refers to a well-defined and fusiform cystic structure located in midline, within the phylum terminale immediately below the conus medullaris, when found isolated, they do not carry any clinical significance, pseudocanus tract, I mentioned this before. It is characterized by a residual cord of fibrous tissue extending from the coccyx to the base of a skin dimple. In ultrasound imaging it is seen as a hypoechoic cord-like structure arising from the tip of the coccyx, dysmorphic coccyx, the tip of the coccyx can vary widely in shape, and in some cases may mimic a mass when palpated on physical examination. Now let's look into some common spinal pathologies. Cord tethering is an incomplete regressive differentiation and failed involution of the terminal cord results in abnormal dorsal fixation of the spinal cord adjacent to the vertebral arches. Tethering of cord can be associated with other forms of spinal dysrophism or can be postoperative. In ultrasound imaging two main features are seen. The conus medullaris is in a low position, below the L2 L3 disc space, absence of normal pulsatile motion of the cord and nerve roots, and associated phylum terminale thickening. Fatty phylum or filler lipomas result from a minor anomaly in secondary neurulation, leading to persistence of dedifferentiated fatty tissue within the phylum terminale, when sonography depicts an echogenic fatty mass causing phylum terminal thickening of greater than 2 mm. It is referred to as phylum terminale lipoma. This is a clinically significant disorder as it may be associated with myelomeningocele, tethered cord, and syringohydromelia, all of which can be easily diagnosed on sonography. A dorsal dermal sinus refers to an epithelium lined tract that extends from the spinal cord, cauda equina, or arachnoid to the skin. It usually manifests with cutaneous stigmata and is mostly found in the lumbosacral region in midline. Sonography may depict a hypoechoic tract extending from the spinal cord to the skin. Lipomyelocele and lipomyelomeningocele, these are skin-covered closed spinal dysrophisms with a back mass. In both these entities, there is presence of a fatty mass in the subcutaneous tissue. The distinction between the two is established by the location of the lipoma, placode interface. In lipomyelocele, the lipoma placode interface lies within the spinal canal, whereas in lipomyelomeningocele, there is expansion of CSF space and the interface lies outside the spinal canal. The lipoma can be echogenic or isoechoic to subcutaneous fat on sonography. Intradural lipoma. This type of lipoma is located within the dural sac, along the dorsal midline. They are more frequent in the lumbosacral region and often associated with tethered spinal cord. Spinal ultrasound depicts an intradural hyperechogenic mass attached to the spinal cord. Diastematomyelia is characterized by the sagittal division of the spinal cord into two symmetrical or asymmetrical hemicords. The length of separation is variable and the lumbar segment of the spinal cord is frequently affected. Ultrasound imaging in the axial plane demonstrate the presence of two hemicords. Hydromyelia refers to dilation of the central canal of the spinal cord. Syringomyelia refers to the presence of a paracentral cystic cavity syrinx related to laceration of the ependymal lining of the central canal and consequent leaking of cerebrospinal fluid into the spinal cord parenchyma. Meningocele implies the herniation of a CSF-filled meninges through a vertebral defect and usually does not contain any part of the spinal cord. On sonography, they appear as anechoic cystic mass, containing no neural tissue. Posterior meningoceles are more common and are mostly found in the lumbar location. 
Anterior meningoceles are more common in sacral region and can present as a presacral mass. That's all for today. Thanks for watching. Happy scanning.